Hello everyone, welcome to Raw Online. This is Dr. Aditi and today we are in our very first lesson in our second module on gastrointestinal system and we are going to take baby steps today in trying to understand more about gastrointestinal system, how it works and what happens when something go wrong. So, what are the basic functions of the gastrointestinal system? So, we have the esophagus where as we all know, no diffusion or absorption takes place. So, this acts only as a conduit with the primary role being propulsion of food. Then we have the stomach. The function of the stomach is predominantly mixing the bolus. So, the proximal stomach plays an important role in storage of the food while the distal stomach exhibits these phasic contractions and results in mixing of the food with the acid and propels it finally through the pylorus into the duodenum. The stomach also has two important secretory functions, two important products derived from the parietal cells of the stomach. One is the hydrochloric acid and the other is the intrinsic factor which protects the B12 all the way until it reaches the ileum where it is going to be absorbed. Then we have the small intestine. Now, the primary function of the small intestine lies in absorption. So, this mixes the food that is delivered from the stomach with the pancreatic juice and bile and ultimately results in absorption. So, majority of the nutrients are going to be absorbed here in the small intestine. Proximally, absorption of nutrients and minerals and vitamins takes place while distally, B12 and bile acids are going to be absorbed in the ileum. And then we have the colon whose primary aim is to dehydrate the stool. So, it significantly reduces the volume of the stool. So, proximal colon plays an important role in absorbing the fluid and dehydrating the stool. Whereas, distally the important function is in propelling and in expelling the stool. So, these are the distinct functions of the different parts of the gastrointestinal system. So, esophagus predominantly works as a conduit and propels the food into the stomach. Stomach plays an important role in mixing the food bolus with the acid. Small intestine, this is where all the absorption takes place and finally colon where a large amount of fluid is absorbed and the stool is dehydrated and is devolumized. So, the transit time of uh, the food boluses differs widely across different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. For instance, the transit time in the esophagus is usually only a few seconds, whereas in the stomach and in the small intestine, the transit time varies from a few minutes to a few hours. Whereas, when you look at the colon, often because it's going to take a long time, to dehydrate and devolumize the stool and there is going to be very very slow transit and therefore the transit time is usually more than a day. Now let us look at the various gastrointestinal disorders. There could be problems in the digestion or absorption. There could be a primary problem in the secretion. There could be a problem with the motility. There could be a problem with the immunity or dysregulated immune function. There could be a problem in the blood supply or there could be a malignancy, a genetically predisposed condition. Sometimes you may have gastrointestinal disorders without any organic abnormalities which is what we would see in irritable bowel syndrome, functional dyspepsia and functional chest pain cases. So, these are the various gastrointestinal disorders. Now, let us look at how the impaired digestion and absorption works. Now, the most common disorder causing impaired digestion and absorption is the lactase deficiency, but this is very benign. So, what does that mean? When a condition is going to be very benign, it is rarely going to cause significant systemic symptoms like loss of weight or uh, other features of nutritional deficiency. Other diseases which may present with all these features like loss of weight or nutritional deficiencies may include celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, infections and post radiation. So, these are all the different causes of disorders affecting the digestion and the absorption. Most common is the lactase deficiency which is benign. Then let us look at some disorders where the root problem is going to be in terms of altered secretion. Now, certain disorders are characterized by hypersecretion. So, when you have hypersecretion in the stomach, that is going to be 
characterized or characteristic of a syndrome called the Zollinger Ellison syndrome, where there is going to be a hyper secretion of the gastric acid. Then you have uh, intestinal and colonic hypersecretion, which can be seen in infections like Giardia, Cryptosporidium, can also be seen in non infectious causes like diabetic diarrhea, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and bile salt diarrhea. And then you have certain conditions where there is going to be a hypo secretion. For instance, in pernicious anemia and in atrophic gastritis, there is going to be a hypo secretion of the gastric acid. So, all these conditions are going to interfere and cause abnormalities of the secretion from the gastrointestinal tract. And then we have certain other disorders which are going to be characterized by altered gut transit. So, for instance, when there is a mechanical obstruction either in the form of a neoplasm or in the form of a stricture or an addition, that is going to cause an alteration in the transit because that is going to impede the transit. Then we have retardation of propulsion. So, um, for instance, if you take the esophagus, there are two kinds of peristaltic waves. No, One is the primary peristalsis, which is going to be initiated by swallowing. And the other is the secondary peristalsis, which is going to be initiated by any local distension in the esophagus throughout the length of the esophagus. Now, when there is going to be a problem with any of these peristaltic movements or there are these sphincters throughout the gastrointestinal tract. No, you have the upper esophageal sphincter, you have the lower esophageal sphincter, you have the pylorus, you have the iliocolic uh, sphincter, iliocolic valve. So, all these they will have to function appropriately. In case there is a dysfunction of these sphincteric regions, that is again going to cause abnormalities in propulsion. So, any condition which is going to retard propulsion uh, or the peristaltic waves is going to result in altered gut transit time. So, for instance, conditions like achalasia, which is a problem with the esophageal motility, gastroparesis, which is characterized by delayed gastric emptying, which can be seen even in diabetics, intestinal pseudo obstruction and slow transit constipation, where there is going to be very slow transit of the fecal output through the colon. All these are different disorders of propulsion, which is going to result in delayed gut transit. So, on the contrary, there are certain disorders which can cause a rapid transit. So, what are these disorders? post vagotomy dumping syndrome, cyclical vomiting syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome and hyperthyroidism can cause rapid transit times.